regret a day in your life? Good days are happy days. Bad days give you experience. And the second one for you. If you are working on something exciting you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. Steve Jobs. Back to you, Mr. President. Amen. Thank you very much. I ask that we, um, everybody mute their mics for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. Happy Thursday. Next week is our open house. Um, we sent out a flyer. Larry sent out a flyer last night. We're doing a triple feature open house with collaboration with Buffalo Flyers, our club and Rhetorical Roar. So send out to your friends, your family, and have them come to any of the open house. And we hope for a good one next week. Dues are due. Um, still got some time left. Please pay to Sylvia. And are there any other announcements? Margo? No, well, actually, I'm going to hand it over to Steve since he's finally unmuting. Steve, I'll, yes. after our conversation yesterday, your turn. Yes. Mm -hmm. This Saturday night, the Barker Lions and I are going to attempt again to do a star search program down at the Margin Manor. We're setting a starting time about 8 o'clock. It'll just be nicely getting dark then. We'll have the moon to look at, as well as Mars, Uranus, and a number of astronomical objects. The weather's supposed to be pretty good. By that, I mean it's supposed to be the upper 30s after it gets dark. So that means it will be a lot more comfortable than it was during the winter, but you still have to dress for it. And there will be, I guess she wants people to bring a dessert to pass. Is that what you said? Yep, and a lawn chair. And a lawn chair would be nice. And we're, if it is inhospitable outside and it's supposed to be good and clear, we'll hang out inside and we'll talk about stuff. But one way or another, it's going down. So join us tomorrow night and or Saturday night. I'm sorry, I'm losing time here. Join us Saturday night and enjoy the night sky. Should be fun. Thank you very much, Steve. Carol? Oh, I just, just wanted to mention that my husband is going to surgery next Monday for uh, some uh, disc surgery that... Uh, Dr. Stevens would probably be familiar with. And actually two chiropractors told him it was time for surgery. <laughs> so keep them in your thoughts. <laughs> we certainly will. And good luck to on his surgery. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, the, the class at the Lockport High School met yesterday, the DECA class. They had a very interesting meeting. The, the children, uh, the kids at the school are competing with other schools in doing a elevator speech. Elevator speech is a one minute speech in which you are to promote something and you have one minute to do it. And you, it's, it's really pretty, they've done some clever things with it. Now they have to record these speeches next uh, before next week and submit them for grading. So it's, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty, pretty. Uh, um, it might be something we might want to consider sometime. It's, it's difficult to do. I, I didn't, when uh, they were talking about doing an elevator speech, I thought, well, you know, you can talk for one minute, but the objectives of an elevator speech are so much different than anything else that we do in our Toastmaster realm. So it's pretty inter pretty interesting and it might be something that uh, we could consider once sometime to uh, do at a meeting. So uh, that's my update. Thank you very much, Tom, for the update. All right, if there's any other announcements, we'll save that at the end of the meeting. I would like to turn the meeting proceedings over to our Toastmaster of the day, the one and only, 
Jack Benny. No, I'm sorry. Dave Licata. You're on mute, Dave. Yep. Still on. Still muted. Hello, everybody. Here's my situation. I'm quite pleased that the 716 has another tourist attraction. I'm proud that the Comedy Center is indeed in Jamestown, New York. But I have to admit that while Keegan, Illinois blew it, and while Keegan, Illinois blew it because the Comedy Museum really should be there because I feel that Jack Benny is a lot funnier than Lucille Ball. Now, I love Lucy just like everybody else, but I do believe Jack Benny had better writers. And I want to incorporate that in my message this morning. And we will work on this Jack Benny thing as we go along. While Keegan did build a statue, uh, erected a statue to Jack Benny, and they named a high school after Jack Benny. And the nickname of the athletic teams is the 39ers, not the 49ers, the 39ers. So for the older people in the club, that, that's an easy thing to relate to. Uh, the younger people have to chew on it maybe for an hour and a half. But let's get into the part where we introduce our role. Now I wanna get this one right out of the way, right at the top of the hour. I want to introduce the general evaluator, Nancy Ferry. Nancy Ferry came to us, and she's one of the people that came to us kind of predisposed to being a Toastmaster. She didn't know it, but she was always a Toastmaster, and she has truly enriched our club. Nancy, could you share with us uh, your duties, which I've already enumerated for you? I'm sorry to steal your thunder. Oh dear, is she there? Nancy's not on, Dave. Oh, that's great. Right All righty right, then, we'll wait for her to show up. Our word master, Sylvia, oh, Sylvia birthday girl, Baptiste. Sylvia? Hi, morning. The word today is miser. A person who hoards wealth and spends as little money as possible. I put it in the chat already. And the reason I picked this word is as I was looking things regarding Jack Benny, there was a YouTube of the game show back in 1961, uh, Password, and he was on it. And this word came up for him to describe to his uh, partner, and he said in his witty way that he has, he's a great uh, ending of uh, giving punchlines of jokes, I should say. He said, me, and apparently everybody in the studio and the other uh, component just bursted out laughing. It was hysterical. They couldn't stop laughing. They had tears in their eyes. So I thought that would be a good word for today. Miser. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Now, do you know why Jack Benny wouldn't eat when he was at the beach? No. Well, he was afraid, you know, with all that sunlight at the beach, he was afraid that a shadow would ask for a bite. I'm after this morning, Samir and I want to tell you, this talk about eliminating the eye master does not fly with the old guy. <laughs> so, Samir, if we can't count any eyes, please count the ta's, because we're saying ta instead of two. And feel free to borrow sure and the other words that annoyed Edna. Samir Rahman is our eye master. Go ahead, sir. He's got connecting right now, Dave. Oh, good. Yeah, he, good. he probably hadn't heard you, so you may have to come back to him. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank my producers. I, I know Jill is here. 
Uh, Jill Roaring is amazing. She spent three years making up her mind whether she wanted to join, and now she's a stalwart and one of the pillars of the club. Uh, Jill, tell us about the grammarian's role. Good morning, Mr. Toastmaster and other fellow Toastmasters and our honored guest right there. My job as grammarian is to listen for excellent phrases and grammar and parts of the English language. And also to listen for those parts of our phrasing that are not so excellent. I will report back at the end of the meeting to you. Thank you so much, Joe. Our quote master, and Anne Marie Leonard likes our club so much that she drives down from Clarence when we're meeting at Tom's Diner. So this is another blessing in our club and we've enjoyed her participation all these many years. And we take great pride when she comes back and she shares with us how Toastmasters made her life easier and more memorable, especially when she had to give speeches at Canisius commencements. Our quote master, Dr. Anne Marie Leonard. Thank you. Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yep. For that one wonderful, warm introduction. Um, Jack Benny was born, of course, as you said, in Waukegan in Illinois. It's interesting, he died at the age of 80 on December 28th, 1974. So that was quite a long time ago. So I'm wondering if a lot of the younger Toastmasters even know who he is. But I love your statue, it's really terrific. So I looked up some quotes. The first one is, I was born in Waukegan a long, long time ago. And as a matter of fact, our rabbi was an Indian. Oh. <laughs> Age is something that doesn't really matter unless of course you are a cheese. Age is strictly a case of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. And a couple other ones. My wife Mary and I have been married for 47 years and not once have we had an argument serious enough to consider divorce. Murder, yes, divorce, never. And the last one, I went to a meeting for premature ejaculators and I left early. Mr. Toastmaster. Oh, oh thank you so much, doctor. That's a quote. Well, we We've seen a racy side of Dr. Leonard this morning, which was uh, <laughs> certainly worth it. Thank you. <laughs> our time, oh, we have a jester. And our jester is Carol Ann Halstead. And we really admire the fact and we treasure the fact that she belongs to Ann Lockport because she came post-retirement and this is where we could use some more people post-retirement because they have so much to share with us. Carol, you ready with a jest? No pressure. <laughs> yes. Actually, this story was attributed to Danny Thomas, and I'm old enough to have heard the original version. There was a man working in the United States and his brother was in the old country. And he told his brother, why don't you come over here? I'll find you a job. However, his brother hadn't learned any English. We said, I will teach you a little bit so you can go to the diner and at least you know, order something to eat. So he says, apple pie and coffee. He says, repeat it. He said, apple pie and coffee. He went to the local diner and he sat down, said apple pie and coffee. So they gave it to him. Well, after about two weeks of apple pie and coffee, he went to his brother from the States and said, you have to teach me something else. I have apple pie and coffee coming out my ears. So... He said, okay, cheese sandwich. So he went to the diner and he sat down and he said, I'll have, well, he, he just could say cheese sandwich. And he looked at the waitress and said, cheese sandwich. She said, 
white or rye? And he looked at her and said, apple pie and coffee. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a nice jest. Our timer is the irascible, colorful Steve Smith. Once again, a born Toastmaster, but found out he was a Toastmaster when he joined. And then thanks to the talent agency of Russell and Lakata, found out he was an actor. What does the timer do, Steve Smith? Well, I will be happy to tell you what I will be doing today. I'll be timing the three important facets, most important facets, which would be table topics, speakers, and evaluators. Table topics is one and a half to two and a half minutes with a 15 second buffer. Buffer Speakers are five to seven minutes, unless otherwise noted, with a 30 second buffer. Evaluators are two to three minutes with a 30 second buffer. And I will report at different times when you call on me, sir. Thank you so much, Steve. Our tech and gesture master, thanks to the miracle of television, we now fly to the East Coast, to the hub of New England. It's Tom Moran in Boston. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. First off, I'm quite familiar with Jack Benny. My uh, parents used to talk about him quite a bit. Uh, they used to watch his show. And I never saw it, but because I hadn't been born yet, but they used to talk about it. And I used to you know, listen to them uh, and, and, sure, uh, and laugh. Now, my job today as tech and gesture master is to watch the meeting and watch all of these little squares here and to comment on what people are doing and maybe not doing during the meeting and during their speeches. So. I would request that everyone who has not opened their screen yet so that I can see them uh, do so. And then that will make my job a whole lot easier. And then I'll report back when uh, the Toastmaster calls upon me at the end of the meeting. And I won't be a miser as far as my report goes. I'm going to, I'm going to tell it like it is. So thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. And thank you so much. Our quiz master, and this is another fine example. And I want to thank everyone for making my job so easy because we didn't have that much trouble filling the roles. There were two roles in question, they got filled automatically by you. I didn't have to chase anybody. And a fine example of that is one of our newest members. And she's going to take over as quiz master because she has a hell of a mentor that said, Mom, you better feel free to take that job, Mom. Our quiz master, Beth Banks. <laughs> Good morning, Dave and fellow Toastmasters. My job will be listening to all the details of speeches and interesting information that is being given out today and quiz you at the end. Are you listening? Hopefully we won't be misers with this information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before I introduce the uh, next job holder, the situation is it was, it's fine to have <clears throat> a few scraps of memories of the Jack Benny TV show. And I'm sure Tom Rand has as many memories of it as I do. Because I'm pretty sure that WBN could get a signal out to Barker when Tom was a wee lad. But he preferred radio. And he preferred radio because that's the theater of your mind. And I want to drive that home today that we have an opportunity as Toastmasters to paint pictures with words. So that was a that was a Jack Benny thing. He really preferred the radio show. If you can get a hold of some old radio shows and peruse them, you'll be quite surprised how active your imagination gets you're gonna work a little bit listening to a Jack Benny radio show because you're gonna give off heat trying to figure out the jokes. The biggest laugh in the history of the golden age of radio is a scene on the radio where Jack Benny was unfortunately held up by a robber. And this got the biggest laugh ever. The robber said, your money or your life. 
And then he paused and paused and his, with his incredible timing. And then the, the bandit said, your money or your life? And he said, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Well, that brings me to Margot Sue Bittner, ETM, hardworking Toastmaster, and our little grammarian nightmare. But today she's <laughs> going to do table topics. Okay, Margot, we now switch to the winery. Margot, take it away. Thank you, Dave. Before I do begin, however, you don't have a general evaluator yet, and there are six people without roles. So before I call on somebody, did one of them want to take on the general evaluator role? I will take that role. Okay, Mark. Thank you. Okay, step up, Mark. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure. So when I worked, found out this topic, we call and you blew it. Like everybody else, I went to the internet and said, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> and the first thing I learned is we Coggan actually had an explosion of a plant. And it devastated the downtown city, which led to a lot of renovation. So I'm going to ask Jim, since you don't have a part, and I know you volunteered this morning, is there some dramatic event in our local history like an explosion or something else that stands out in your mind, please do not be a miser with your words and make time and I'll hand it over to you, Jim. Thank you, Margo. I live in the city of North Tonawanda and one of the most memorable explosions was at the Jurez plant. Now they had a fire whistle that blew and when you heard that you counted them as they went on the more the worse it was going to be. Well, I was in junior high and I heard the whistle and we told the teacher who was not a mem who didn't live in North Tonawanda, it's gonna be an explosion. And sure enough, all the windows rattled. That day, I also had a doctor's appointment and my mom came to pick me up and we saw a fire truck after fire truck ambulances rushing to the scene, but Fortunately, nobody was really hurt in that explosion. There were other explosions, and I know that the Graf Hospital was always equipped to take care of those. That was a very uh, memorable experience for me remembering that. Also, there were uh, some others in North Tonawanda because we're industrial for um, lumber and some other things. And I remember those, I remember the downtown, the whole block exploded and it started in the Murphy company or the Murphy's was a store, which is no longer there. And that decimated the whole block, but it's been rebuilt. And now there's a spot coffee there, which I hope to go to and not miser uh, the intake of coffee there because I do like my coffee in the morning. But those are some of the memorable things I remember in North Tonawanda, and there have been others around our area, but that was most memorable to me. Mr. or Mrs. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Table dogs, Master. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for jumping in. Then the second thing I learned was about Jack Benny, and J Dave's given us a number of things he's spoken about, but what he hasn't mentioned yet is his violin. So I was wondering, Tracy, since you were alternate speaker and aren't doing your job today, did you play an instrument in school? I personally played the flute and the violin and the violin for a very short time and piano, believe it or not. So Tracy, again, make time and don't be miserly with your words. Thank you, tabletop, Madam Table Topics Master. I was never, I'm still not very musical. Nobody wants to hear me sing. I can't carry a tune and I'm often flat. However, I have been attracted to music throughout my life. And when I was like in kindergarten, this is before like girls actually played drum, drums or anything. I wanted to, it must've been elementary school. I wanted to play the drums. My parents didn't really want me to play that, but that's okay. The only thing is when I wanted to join the school band, they said girls didn't play drums. So I was not doing anything else. The clarinet was not for me. Later on in high school, I did learn how to play the guitar. That was kind of fun. Me and my best friend used to 
walk over to the Keenan Center with a guitar and we learned how to strum a couple of songs. Beyond that, no musical talent whatsoever. And I, but I was also in the choir at church for years and years. And at Grace Episcopal Church, when that was still a church, you used to get paid for being in the choir. So we got 10 cents every week or something. And when you're a little kid in grade school and middle school without a job, at the end, two, three bucks was kind of cool, especially just for showing up to choir, which your parents made you go to church anyways. We were getting paid to go to church. To me, I wasn't that miserly with my money. Usually every Monday after we got paid, I would run out to the mall because that was within walking distance to us and we would buy something with it. Those were in the days where you could <laughs> for a dollar buy a new outfit for your Barbie doll. Yep, I did that too. <laughs> so that, and sometimes we didn't even have enough money for that. And it didn't matter because at AM and A's, they knew who we were and they would catch our parents the next day and say, hey, your kid owes us an extra 50 cents or whatever. And we got away with that. Or we were just a little bit short and they didn't care that's kind of giving away my age. I'm getting old now, but those were the days. <laughs> we weren't as miserly then. We, everybody took care of each other and those were the good old days. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Tracy. Tracy, I, I'm an off key monotone. I can't sing worth a darn. Playing the instrument, I'm okay. Singing, uh-uh, not for me. So there is somebody else very famous from Waukegan. His name was Ray Bradbury, the science fiction writer. So I know, Kate, as a historian, you like to read. Do you read science fiction or what do you prefer to read? Kate Banks. I saw you Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Table Topics Master and fellow Toastmasters. I'm just a voice right now. You can hear through my mother's <laughs> audio. No, no, we'll keep it that way. <laughs> I, I wasn't as miserly with my sleeping hours last night as I ought to have been. I apologize for my lateness. And Margo is wise and didn't allow that to let me escape <laughs> from participating in table topics. I love to read. Yes, she knows. Not quite as much as you. I wish, I wish I sat in a big, beautiful home with the large windows. And I wish I weren't allergic to the cats so that I could have them all around me <laughs> and be enjoying a great book. I love science fiction, but I think history is my passion, my true passion. I have more books of history, whether it's biographies or the other end of the spectrum, historical fiction. Right now I'm reading a couple of fascinating books. My mom gave me the ladies, the daring ladies of Lowell, which is about the ladies and men, gentlemen in Massachusetts uh, and the early industrial age working in the, the cotton mills and the fabric factories and how they began pressing for reforms even in the early 1800s. And also I'm reading a book that I've been chipping through called Jerusalem. It's a biography of the city, which is absolutely fascinating. I'll probably finish that today. It's almost a thousand pages long. And yes, the author was not miserly in his descriptions, but the history <coughs> of the city is so fascinating. Over a thousand years of details are crammed into this book and I've learned more from this and recommended by my uncle who then his next recommendation is all about the textiles of the world. And if even if you're not into history, this is a fascinating book that he gave to my grandmother and I read it to her when I'm visiting her and it's amazing how it ties in together even to the Daring Ladies of Lowell and what's happening in what was happening in and across America at that time, all the way through to the silk trade or cotton in other parts of the world. I guess I could give her a speech on that someday since I've made time. Thank you, Madam Table Topics. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Yes, I remember studying Lowell in college with my industrial and labor relations degree. Fascinating story. With that, I would like to call for a word master report. How did the word miser do this morning with our table topic speakers? I was a little worried at first. Uh, Tom Moran started off the ball with miser, Beth, 
<laughs> and our table topics, all three have said it at least once. Tracy twice, Kate twice, Margo, you three times. Thank you. You're welcome. And our timers report, how did we do on time this morning? I have a happy report. All three of our table topic speakers qualified. Jim at a minute 50, Tracy at two minutes 36, and Katie at two minutes and 13 seconds. Easily qualifying, everybody. Good job. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it back over to our Toastmaster of the day, David Licata, who makes beverages his life. Dave. You're still muted, Dave. He's still muted, Dave. Can you hear me now? Now we got you. Okay, I can't unmute if the screen is up to vote. All right. There. I'm sorry. Alrighty then. Uh, Jack Benny was not a miser in real life. He once tipped a hatchet girl $5 and shoved it back at him. She said, I want to keep my illusions. The best miser story is that Jack did use a pay toilet, exited the stall, discovered that his wallet had fallen out of his pants. So he squatted down to see if the wallet was on the floor inside the stall behind the locked door. Seeing his wallet, he reached for it. At that time, a we'll call him a civilian, because the person wasn't in show business, walked in, recognized him and said, it's true, it's true. All right, we're gonna get on with our speaking portion. Our first speaker this morning is Thomas Hultwine, but most important from my point of view, it's always the evaluation. So I want to invite Marty Johnson, evaluator number one, to give us a little outline of Thomas's goals. And Marty's a reclamation product. He joined Toastmasters, we lost him, he came back, and now he's a DTM. So I guess we do our job at AM Locks. Marty. Thank you, David. Hello, Toastmasters, good morning. This morning, Thomas is speaking from Pathways, the dynamic leadership path. With the uh, evaluation and feedback number two, the time is five to seven minutes. And the purpose of Thomas's speech this morning, one second. <clears throat> the purpose of his speech this morning is to present a speech on any topic, receive feedback, and apply it to a second speech. The, the purpose of the speech is for the member to demonstrate that he or she has applied the feedback received from his or her first speech. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Marty. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce someone that gave a speech last week, and he knows that AM Lockport is a workshop. He has enjoined us to help him out with some advice, some evaluation. And this good old Thomas Coutwine, one of our newer members, by the way, the title of the speech is a leprechaun married a unicorn. A leprechaun married a unicorn. Tom. Hello, I am Lockport. And I, I see you out there. Using the magic powers, we have a guest, Jim. Hello, Jim. You have to forgive me, my voice is a little dry. Last night I did too much drinking. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it'd be a good morning. Well, I'm going to tell you this morning about the love story. 
a long story about how I found me unicorn. We mythical creatures just like you humans do fall in love. And finding someone to love, oh, that can be terribly hard. Well, you have the future where I'm loving have, have, happily ever after, but you have the past. And I need to tell you the story about how I fell in love. Leprechauns, although we are very strong with magic, we are not as pure as we should be. I knew it would not be an easy task. But I saw a unicorn one day and I was infatuated with her. She was so beautiful, so pure, unbelievable. I had to find out and I had to work to make her fall in love with me. At that time, all my intentions were good. But as you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I tell you, in the beginning, the good intentions seemed like enough. But I saw her. I saw her so clearly. She was beautiful. She was so pure. I would gaze at her beauty for days. And I thought to myself, how, I can't approach her. I need to let her know. Well, I decided to go to the witch. The witch was not an evil, ugly witch. She was a good witch, beautiful and pure. I had to travel all the way from Ireland over to Sweden. I had to go across the ocean to find her. I went there. I told her, can you get a message to the unicorn? Can you do this for me? I give you a little bit of my gold. Well, she went on and on. Oh, you would know that I love, and my love is so pure. I have a husband, and he is so wonderful. I will do these for you, but you need to we had the warning. She warned me. It would require me to change. Now me being a leprechaun, I'm a little bit of a trickster. I'm definitely a miser, but I was strong. So I thought no problem. And when as I was traveling back across the ocean, I saw a beautiful couple. I knew in my heart, I saw them, and I saw their love. I knew I had to keep my eye on the ball. I had to remember my priorities. Well, the unicorn heard and we met, and all I thought went well that day. We traveled, we saw the sights, we even shared a meal. I tried to impress her with my magic to show how strong I was. I thought that would impress her. I expressed how I felt. I told her, I, I will show you my heart. Well, she took one look into my, my heart and she said one word to me, Vega, and ran away. I was like, oh no. I had to find out what, what to do. So I go back, travel back across the ocean. And sure enough, the witch this time was smarter. She knew I'd be back. She could see into the future. She said, I can help you. She didn't say that. She had three wishes. But she was smart. Her first wish had something to do with heart. Her second wish had something to do with death. But I do remember her third wish. She said, you will not remember the first two wishes I have made. 
until the third wish. Come, I use my third wish, so you will not remember them until they come true. What? How long would I have to wait? I waited a mere two seasons. And at that time I heard the witch had died. And I'm like, what's going on? I thought I gave her some sort of wish against death. Well, all this time I had worked so hard to try and fix myself. All those dear seasons, I two whole seasons I worked on it. And I had done that work. And I had become a better man, a better leprechaun. But then, combined with that, on the other hand, were her two wishes. Her two wishes were that, wish one, I wish that all the love and purity of my heart goes to you. My second wish is that this will happen upon my death. And of course, her third wish would I would not remember the first two wishes until the first two came true. So I had changed the work I had done and the unselfish use of her wishes for me also affected me so deeply that someone could be so kind with their wishes. When I saw the unicorn, they don't do it often, but she had a tear in her eye. I went up to her and she said one word again, yes. I said, yes, what yes? Yes, I will marry you. And that is our story of love of how a leprechaun married a unicorn. Should you're someone muted, tell Dave. him I can't hear him? David, you're muted again. I, I'd i really like to know why the powers that be would mute the Toastmaster of the day. I'm sorry. Because <clears throat> you were sneezing Alrighty too much. <laughs> All righty then. Our second evaluator is David Jones. He discovered us on the World Wide Web. And we are humbled by the fact that this person from North Carolina decided to join our club. I can't wait to hear him speak and I can't wait for the speech about where he's gonna show us his locker. David Jones, could you tell us the objectives of speaker number two, David or Davey? Oh, please tell me he's here. Sure. Yeah. Right. Just I am. Uh, I'm pulling a David today. I I was speaking while I was muted. Yes, <laughs> David Jones's locker is fine. Um, Eric will be speaking from Pathways Innovative Planning Level Two, and it is purpose is to connect with an unfamiliar audience, which is going to be difficult here since he knows most people. But I am a miser with my blood, so maybe he can convince me otherwise because the title of his Speech is donating blood. Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster. All right, it's my great pleasure to introduce a remarkable young man, an enthusiastic young man, and a man that's made our club a better place. Eric Schneider, donating blood. Eric. Mr. Toastmaster, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. Fellow Toastmasters, good morning. It's good to be with you all. This morning, we're going to talk about donating blood. Now, I know you guys are wondering, donating blood, what is he talking about today? How many of you 
have donated blood in your lifetime? All right, quite a few. Today, we're gonna take a nice trip back on how I started donating blood and how it changed me for over a decade. It all started in June of 2008, ending my sophomore year of high school. And I see that the American Red Cross was doing a blood drive at the high school. And that really sparked my interest. So I walked in, signed in, went to one of the cubicles that they had and taking all my information. Then came the physical examination. They did, you know, my pulse, they did my iron, they did my blood pressure, the works. But something happened that didn't qualify me to donate. I was coming from gym class. They took my blood pressure. The reading was 168 over 108. Now that sounded the alarm bells right off the bat. Well, like I said, mind you, I was coming from gym class. So I was pretty bummed out because I wanted to donate blood. I really wanted to save lives. Down the road, we're going into senior year of high school. I was coming from school. My mother picked me up. We went to the Red Cross Donation Center down the street over here on Davison, where it used to be. And I donated blood. I was eligible. Everything was fine. But then something happened during the donation. I was told you have to eat an hour before you donate and drink plenty of fluids. So what happened was, as I was sitting lying back, you know, squeezing the squeeze ball so to pump the blood into the bag. I passed out for about one to two minutes. Then all of a sudden I came back into consciousness. It wasn't a pretty picture because as I was starting to feel a little better, I walked to the table where all the goodies were. As I was marking down my next donation, I passed out again and boom, I landed on the floor. Not a pretty picture again. On the way home with my mother, as we were turning around the bend into the neighborhood, I wasn't feeling good again. And then I like bleh, right over my mother's car because I didn't eat anything. So I moved on to units before connect before they changed to connect life. And what sparked my interest was platelet donations, where they have you sit on on a recliner and they hook you up to a machine. You got three bags, one's for your red blood cells, one is your platelets, and the other one is for your white blood cells. The process takes two hours to donate. So what better way to spend two hours than to donate? Because I'm saving lives. I read that I can help burn burning victims. I can help almost anyone who needs platelet donation. And the best part of this, I can donate every two weeks. And also they can mail me one of these, my donate life, my donate life card. Tell you your name, what your blood type is, which mine is AB negative. I have a rarest blood type and a universal donor. And right now, so far this year, I have done four platelet donations. I can donate up to 24 times a year. 
Now, fellow Toastmasters, with, with all of that said, will you all join me in donating blood? Help me. I would like you guys to join me on this mission as we help to save lives. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Eric. Now, moving on to speaker number three. But first we have to introduce the evaluator. And the evaluator for Jen Zappa this morning is uh, Larry Eggert. Uh, Larry, I recruited Larry and I thought, well, I'll take a shot and I'll ask the police chief of Lockport, New York, if he'd like to come to a Toastmasters meeting. And he was more than agreeable. And I think he was predisposed again, because I think he did a little homework on us. And it's been a pleasure to have Larry Eggert in this club. Chief, what are Jen's goals this morning? First of all, I'd like to rephrase that statement from recruitment to stalking. Uh, I finally joined just so I could get him out of my office. <laughs> but it worked out very well. <laughs> Thank wow. you, Mr. Mr. Toastmaster, for that wonderful introduction. My job today as evaluator three is to evaluate the uh, number three speaker, a Toastmaster who is never miserly with her words or miserly with her setup behind her, you'll, you'll notice she always has a really good uh, background. Today is a nice arrangement of flowers and a brand new set of curtains I see. So working very well there. She will be talking today about communicating change. So the purpose of the project is for Jen Zapla to practice the skills needed to effectively communicate change to a group or organization. Mr. Timer, her time is five to seven minutes. And Mr. Toastmaster, do you have her title? Indeed, I do. Because Thank you, Mr. When Toastmaster. When Jen volunteers the title, you better be ready, because this is an exemplary Toastmaster, Jen Zapla. And I'm going to share a little inside. I was eating my breakfast at Tom's Diner. I had my mouth full, and a guest showed up. And I said, oh, Lord, it's my job to jump up and greet this person. But I have my mouth full and I got to get out of the chair and it's 10 yards away. And before I could get up, I heard Jen say, I got this. And she went over and greeted that guest. And I'll never forget that, that eagerness. It's Jen Zappa time, everybody. And the title of her speech is, Let's Talk About Time. Little Jenny, brighter than a penny. Take it away. Thank you, David. I'm, I'm not sure what you said my title was, but it's Let's Talk About, and I'm, I'm going to share my screen with you all. Let's Talk About Gender is the title of my speech. And I know, Tom, look, you look so excited here. So we're going to talk about gender today. And gender is a little bit different than sex, Tom. So I did not steal your speech. Sex is our biological differences, while gender is our social constructs. Now, today, what I really want to focus on is the way that we think about gender in a binary fashion. We tend to think about it in terms of our biological differences, but we use those biological differences as social constructs. And the way that we do that, we have stereotypical roles that we have um, expectations, what we think others may be like in terms of their personality, in terms of what their role should be in a household, in a career, the way they dress, the way that they act. We have a lot of expectations around gender roles. And if you take a look at some of the roles that I've listed on this screen, whether you're male or female, you may find that you do portray some of these qualities or characteristics in both sets of roles. And so what I wanna talk about is why we think in the binary, why we construct our world in a way where male and female are so important to us. 
And I want to ask you, fellow Toastmasters, really more for curiosity here, when the first time you realized, maybe as a child, uh, sometime in your life, when you realized that there were differences between males and females, how old were you the well, first I time? With a girl, so I was born as a boy. So that was the first time I saw the difference. When you were born, okay. Well, if you wanna put it in the chat, if you have other times in your life, I think I was probably about four years old the first time I realized that males and females were treated differently. I was pretty young and I specifically remember it was related to, uh, my boy cousins were very much encouraged to go to the bathroom outside if they had to go to the bathroom and I was not. So I, I was very upset about that as a young child, although I can appreciate some of the uh, rationale behind it. But it was my very first introduction to understanding that the expectations were different for males and females. Now I want to talk about some other terms that you may or may not have heard and what they mean. I know they can be confusing and they seem to change. So these are common terms now. It doesn't mean that they'll be the most appropriate terms in the future. Some of these terms have replaced terms that we may have been more familiar with in the past. But I want to talk about what each one means because you may not know. Cisgender is a term that relates to uh, a person's sense of identity being tied to the gender that they were assigned at birth or the sex they were assigned at birth, I should say. Intersex is a term that's related to differences in anatomy. It can be hormonal. It can be specific where uh, chromosomally you're not specifically male or female. So there's a lot of different versions of intersex. It's not a one size fits all term. And then non-binary is when a person um, is not defined in terms of those binary oppositions or refuses to be. So that can be uh, someone who doesn't identify with either male or female in terms of um, their, their identity in gender. And transgender is when a person, uh, their identity and gender doesn't correspond with the sex that they were assigned at birth. So these terms, some of the people can overlap. You can be in more than one category, depending. And I wanna talk about some facts about that because there are a lot of confusing things. So intersex people account for, there's a differentiation here, um, up to 1.7% of people. And that really depends on how you're counting people, what sort of syndromes you're counting. It depends on if you're counting uh, chromosomes or hormones or all different sorts of uh, things that people may go through. Now, atypical sex characteristics can go unnoticed until puberty. So you can actually be intersex and not know it until much later in your life. Gender identity does not equal sexual identity. So that's also important to note. You can have a different gender identity, but still have a sexual identity that's normal. You can be cisgender and also gay, for example. And then some of these other statistics are really kind of scary and frightening in terms of what's out there and what other people face based on their gender identities. Now, I know recognition does not happen everywhere in the world. In some countries, you are allowed to not have a gender listed using X as a category, for example. And some of the countries are pretty interesting. The US right now does not have any federal recognition of X as a gender category. You have to choose male or female. And there's very unclear rights protections. That's something that we'll probably see in the Supreme Court in the near future related to gender identity. Interestingly, New York State does have some Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act that prohibits discrimination for human rights laws and for um, hate crime laws, I believe. But there's no ability in New York State to choose X on the DMV. So you have to choose a male or female. You are allowed to change your gender if you're transgender, however, and in New York City, you are allowed to choose X as a gender. Now, what can you do as a person? First of all, treating everyone with respect is important in our lives. 
That should go without saying, but I don't think it always does. If you're asked to use a pronoun that you may be unfamiliar with or not used to using, respect it. You know, if someone, I'm, I'm Jennifer and I often introduce myself as Jen, people generally respect it. It's important to respect people's beliefs about themselves. And if you're confused or you don't know what pronoun to use when you're speaking to a person, ask them. If you're responsible for creating forms or taking in information on someone, make sure that your forms are inclusive. Don't require a gender or a title or allow alternate options. And finally, think about your own perceptions and beliefs because gender binary doesn't just impact people from the intersex or transgender communities. It impacts all of us in the way we socialize our beliefs. For example, you might hear the phrase, man up or don't be a girl. Using phrases like that can be offensive and they can also really be self-defeating for recognizing the differences in all of us and appreciating that we have them. Fellow Toastmasters, I hope that you will change your thoughts and beliefs and respect all people is equal regardless of their gender. Thank you. Jen, thank you so much. Now I'd like to call on Steve Smith, our timer. Hello. Uh, I unfortunately have to report that the only one that qualified was Eric Schneider. Tom ran over at seven minutes, 52 seconds. Jen ran over at eight minutes and 16 seconds. So. Your winner by default is going to be Eric. Thank you. All right. There's no need to vote. So don't put that screen, screen up because it tends to cut me off. That's not a, bad thing. a little filler is called for at this point in the meeting. And the amazing thing was Jack Benny's producer on his radio and television show was a gentleman named Freddie de Cordova. Thank you. Freddie went on to be the producer of The Tonight Show. Mm -hmm. So for us people that are, look, can look back on The Tonight Show, especially with Johnny Carson, we can see the similarities between the structure. A, a drunken band that originated on Jack Benny and Johnny Carson had Ed McMahon and Jack Benny had Don Wilson as kind of a sidekick. So he made a lot of contributions that way. Now, to tie him in with being a speaker, being a Toastmaster, in interviews, Jack Benny said that a show was never written. It was rewritten over and over again. Jack Benny said that he and his writers would spend 20 minutes deciding if they wanted to use the word but or another word. So they took great care in the writing. And once again, I want you to see if you can get a hold of some of the radio shows. They're incredibly funny. They're incredibly well-written. Now we'll move on to the evaluation portion of our program. Our first evaluator this morning, evaluating Mr. T uh, Tom, is our boy Marty. Marty, we're ready. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters. A leprechaun married a unicorn. Imagine that. Tom, I enjoyed your presentation this morning about how you, how you fell in love with a unicorn that you saw one day and about your travels, about your travels to Ireland. A couple, a couple key things that I wanted to mention. The speech is a speech where you apply feedback. And I was trying to figure out exactly what feedback you were using. And I'm, I'm just going to go with what I, my understanding of it is. Your vocal variety, I think the last time you gave the presentation, I think I remember hearing uh, about your vocal variety and, and being clear in your tone and your, your voice. I think you did a great job with that, Tom. You spoke like a leprechaun throughout the whole 
presentation, which I give you credit for because it, it's hard. It's hard to do that and not go back to your normal voice. I liked your costume that you had. I liked your energy. At one point, at one point, you had a lot of energy going. You were spinning in your chair. And I was I was hoping that you would stay upright and, and not wipe out from the chair. That would have been that would have been awful. But I'm glad you stayed in the chair, Tom. Excellent balance this morning. You seem very comfortable with the audience. And your your words, as I mentioned, were, were clear when you spoke. Uh, a couple things. A couple things I would, from what I heard and what I what I saw, I would recommend to continue to work on is at times I noticed it was hard for me to hear uh, a few keywords. So in that regards, what I would do, I would I would slow slow down when you are making important points, if you will, especially main points. For example, two examples what the unicorn said to you. And you can say that slowly and enunciate it. And second, the second example would be what your three wishes were. And I think that would help make the presentation more understandable to me and hopefully to the, to the audience. Tom, I feel you're doing a, a, a wonderful job with Pathways. You've grown quite a bit since your icebreaker, actually by by leaps and bounds, I can say. And you're always you're always there, ready to give a speech. And I hope that you'll use my what I noticed and my my feedback for another presentation. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much, Marty. Uh, Phil Harris was Jack Benny's band leader, and he used to use his uh, corn pone southern accent. So that was an opportunity for gags. And he used to sing a song about where he was from. And he used to say he was from Dewa Diddy, North Carolina. And Jack Benny would insist that there was no such place. So that was an opportunity for humor. And Davy Jones does have a lot of humor, but he's going to be very serious when he evaluates speaker number two, Eric. Now we switch you to the sunny south, Dave Jones, David Jones. Thank you, Dave. And I know you can't see me on your phone, but behind me is my Davy Jones's locker that my dad made for me when I was in elementary school. Well, so I, I can, do I can see that. I can see that on my phone. And it's got a little military thing there that says Jones. To Eric, Eric, I've never heard you uh, speak before. I've seen you do roles. I've watched your um, poetry reading on YouTube, but you did a really good job. And the first thing I noticed was, of course, my favorite thing is standing because it gives you a lot of energy, especially at 7.45 in the morning for you to be able to stand up and engage the audience. And that was part of your uh, task today was to connect with the audience. You started your speech by asking a question and you also ended it by asking a question, which is additional engagement where some people might zone off in speeches, but if you ask questions, they have to engage with you. You also showed your blood uh, donation card, which is a prop, which again, engages the audience. So you kind of did three different things to, to keep the audience engaged. The other thing you did was storytelling. You showed us, you didn't tell us. I felt like I was at high school with you, going through the process of you trying to uh, give blood. And that's the best way to do storytelling is just to engage us with colorful words and just kind of make us feel like we were there. And I actually felt like I was there. The other part of your uh, speech was to talk about a topic that was unusual. And giving blood is definitely an unusual topic, a little uncomfortable to some, myself included. And let's see, you had good eye contact. And part of your speech was to engage the audience and connect with them. And it's kind of hard on Zoom to look at everybody and then also make eye contact by looking at the little green dot. But it seemed like you stood far enough back that I couldn't tell if you were looking at the audience or looking at the thing. So I think that, that worked out well for you. 
you had good volume, good pace. Your hand gestures were good. You kind of pointed down the street when you were talking about it. You counted out some items. And what else? You didn't feel you looked very comfortable giving your speech. Um, I think on your poetry reading, you're always looking at the camera to see who's on there and who's not. But here you you seem very comfortable. The only areas of improvement I could see would maybe be some vocal variety, maybe give an ouchie or something like that when you, you did the pen. The other thing I thought would have been great, um, even though it was a serious speech, a little bit humorous, when you talked about um, passing out, could have fell on the ground. Looks like you had plenty of room there. And to challenge yourself, maybe you can get with Dr. Gerald next time and actually be giving blood while you're giving a speech about blood. Just <laughs> Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster. Oh, thank you. Let me check my, oh, I am, I, I'm on, thank God, all righty. Our third evaluator is Chief Larry Eggert. He will be not interrogating, evaluating Jen Zappla. Larry Eggert. Thank you again, Mr. Toastmaster. It was my privilege to evaluate Jen today. A bit of a daunting task because she is a, an outstanding Toastmaster. So I did spend a little more time and patience with this evaluation. What better topic to talk about when you're talking about change than the, the, the talk about uh, sex and gender? It, it's a socially relevant topic today. I think it's something that I think when when you started your talk, I think you've had everybody's attention because it was it's so relevant and so recent. The PowerPoint was excellent. I have to tell you, you have to show me how you superimpose your picture on that PowerPoint. That was that is fantastic because I have to use PowerPoint once in a while. You started out with a couple of questions to challenge the audience to actually get us thinking. Why do we think in the binary? And when did you realize your gender? And I actually, you got me thinking, I'm thinking, what you said four years old, I was thinking, well, probably about the same time for me. And some, you know, your, your your way of doing that at four years old was interesting with the outdoor bathroom thing, but it was similar when you said that, I said, yeah, that's about the same time in the same way that I did. So that was, I think everybody was caught with that. So that was excellent. I like the fact that you used, it was more of an educational talk. And I think the the way you constructed it was perfect for that because I think people of my generation needed to hear some of those things to understand uh, this discussion that's going on in society today. And I'll just tell you, the, I know the police academies, uh, there's been a couple of transgender police recruits. Uh, I guess the good thing I can tell you is that uh, your generation, and maybe the generation after you, uh, doesn't have a problem with that. And I was a little bit surprised when I did hear that uh, from some of my, of my police colleagues. You showed some statistics, which is good. You, you talked about a worldview, which is even more important. Um, what could you do to make it better? Um, maybe some more gestures, maybe a little bit, but I, I don't even know if gestures are proper in a setting that you were doing with uh, an education. I was even thinking some humor, but boy, you'd really have to be careful with that. <laughs> I suppose you could sneak a little humor in there on some of that, but overall, it, it was an excellent topic. It was it was well timed. It was your your pace was good. Your your cadence as you spoke was excellent. And I will just tell you that uh, if you ever have a problem with um, gender issues, and speaking from the male perspective, if you have a daughter, you certainly don't want your daughter to be boxed in by some of that. So and that's the, the last thing I thought of as you were as you were finishing up. So overall, great speech. Can't wait to hear the next one. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Larry. Now we want to call on Steve Smith, who's not only watching the sky, he's watching the clock. The timers report for the evaluators, please. Thank you. I'm happy to report all three evaluators came well within the time. So all three qualify. That's fantastic. So we'll wait just a moment to see who pops up here and please vote. Alrighty, I voted. Before I introduce the general evaluator, 
I want to say that part of the reason that the Comedy Hall of Fame is in Jamestown rather than Waukegan, Waukegan seems to be much bigger. It's a suburb of Chicago, and they have incredible amount of famous people that come from Waukegan. And the amazing thing is Jack Benny got his first music lesson from his neighbor. And his neighbor was a teacher at the local high school that was teaching Jack piano before he got into the violin. And incredibly, his neighbor's name was Graham. And the Grahams had a son named Otto. And Otto Graham lived next door to Jack Benny. And Otto Graham's in the Professional Football Hall of Fame. So that's one of the reasons. But without further ado, as I've said many times when I go to introduce this particular Toastmaster, he has always been kind enough to bring his expertise that he learned from his job at Verizon. And he has helped us over his, the tenure of his membership become much more organized. And he's a star in management, Mark Campos. And Mark, it's your choice whether you want to introduce the job holders or not for the reports, or you can turn it back to me. I only ask that you turn it back to me for the last word, because being Dave Licata, I insist upon that. Our general evaluator, Mark Campos. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters. Good morning. And David, I, I truly appreciate you giving me the, the latitude to make that decision whether I call for the reports or not. And I will definitely call for the reports, but I will ensure that you have the last word because we want to keep you happy, David. So first and foremost, fellow Toastmasters, I would like to begin with feedback for the Toastmaster of the day. David, David, very fun theme. Not surprisingly, chock full of trivia and anecdotes, as only you can provide. So great job with that. From a, a housekeeping standpoint, great job filling the roles prior to the meeting. When the meeting begins, I, I'm very paranoid as Toastmaster. I have my checklist of job holders. And as I see people enter Tom's Diner or enter Zoom, I'm checking them off the list. I would encourage you to do the same because you are outstanding at wonderful, glowing introductions for job holders, but at least two of them were wasted today, tragically, because you were unaware that the individuals were not yet in the one case didn't attend the meeting, the other case was running a little bit late. So a lot of wasted energy there you could have avoided. David. You are mute button challenged. This is not anything new. You are not the only member of the club that is challenged in this regard. And, and sorry, Tom, I'm encroaching onto the tech master role a little bit. And I'm, I usually am one to say stay in your lane, but I think this is important. Now, maybe it's easy for me, been in corporate America a long time, a lot of web conferences, a lot of conference calls. If I hadn't mastered the mute button, trust me, I would not be here today. I would have been fired a long time ago. So it's essential that you master one thing in these meetings, and that is the mute button. When you enter the meeting, mute immediately. And think of it this way. Let me draw an analogy for everyone. You're driving your car. You need to change your lane. Most of us, at least, the vast majority of us don't just change the lane. You do two things. You turn on a directional, you change lanes, and then you turn off the directional. Think in those terms. You need to speak, you unmute. You say what you have to say, and then you mute immediately because it saves you from distracting others in the meeting. So I'll jump off the soapbox there. For our evaluators, Marty, one thing I would, I would say, I, evaluation is my, by far my favorite job in Toastmasters. And I've always said that one of the best things about it is you get a great speaking opportunity, but you don't have to really prepare. You don't have homework to do. And then I, I thought about it this morning that that's not entirely true. You were a little clunky on the introduction, 
and I think maybe prepare just a little bit more so you have that at the ready. You always need to know the, the speech title and the objectives and all that. And you had made a comment about being a little bit unsure of what Thomas, what feedback Thomas tried to incorporate from his previous version of the speech to the current version. I think it might have been incumbent upon you to maybe reach out to him to find out what he incorporated so you could evaluate how well he did that, just in case you couldn't remember yourself what the last speech was like, just, just some feedback. Uh, David Jones, chock full of wonderful feedback for Eric, really front loaded on tons of feedback. Then you were running short on time and you were rushing through constructive feedback. You know, we're big proponents in AM Lockport of the sandwich approach, which I'm sure you've heard about, positive, constructive feedback, and then end with positive to complete the sandwich. You could have been, your, your evaluation was just a missed opportunity, maybe just to end with something really positive. Otherwise, great feedback for Eric. And Larry Eggert, again, very nice feedback. A uh, lot, lot of great things for Jen. It was a tough speech to evaluate. She did do a great job, but you did take the sandwich approach, which I appreciate it. Now with that, I will call for job holders. And first and foremost, I will call on our tech and gesture master, Tom Moran. Tom. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator. I am thoroughly impressed with all of our speakers today and their, let's say, technical ability and how things have improved with each and every meeting that we go to. First, I, I wanted to start with Jill. I, I am envious of your commitment to the Zoom process. I see now that you have in back of you the for being the uh, a timer, you have like the different colored cards that go up there with the Toastmaster M. I mean, this takes a commitment. You've got to sit down and take some time and work this stuff out and figure out how to do it. So I was very impressed. Uh, David, um, Mark all mentioned already the uh, problem with uh, mute and unmute. And uh, he forgot to mention, though, that you did a very nice uh, uh, Verizon commercial there for them that, uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? So that, that came through quite, uh, quite clear, and I'm sure it was appreciated. Thomas, when he gave his speech, which I thoroughly enjoyed, I had an idea that perhaps you could use a virtual background for your leprechaun scene, maybe something similar to what, if you look up at uh, Jill's background there, she has that growth of green plants and, and all that. And I'm sure you have the capability to, of doing that. That would have added so much more to your already delightful speech. So that was that was something that I, I thought of while you were giving the speech. I really liked your facial expressions, your use of your hands when you were thinking, you put your hand, your, you did this with your chin. Uh, you did, you did a, a lot in that that added to it. And it's it seemed very on point for the story that you were telling. And I thought, I know the speakers this morning had an issue with going overtime. I think only one qualified. And I noticed when I was looking at the cards for the speakers, because I was curious to say who was going to make time, that there's very little distinction between the green and the yellow on the cards. And that can be confusing sometimes when you're speaking as to how much time you have left to give to your speech. So I would suggest that in addition to the cards that you're going to look at for the change of color, that you also set your iPhone so and put it up on the screen so that you know exactly where you are on time, because ultimately the time comes down to you. You've, you've got to be responsible for that as well. And I would have liked to see everyone qualify today for speaking. Um, Jen, my guy, I don't, I don't know what to say about your speech. I mean, you're setting the bar so high for fellow Toastmasters with the PowerPoint and what um, your evaluator 
added that you included a little picture of yourself when you shared the screen. This is that was something that always bothered me when people would share the screen is because you lost a visual of the speaker. And that was just so very professional. And I like the subject matter that you covered today. And I, the one suggestion I would make is that when you are giving your your PowerPoint, I love the color of the screen and everything, but down in the lower left hand corner of your screen, I would give a credit to uh, Tom Moran uh, for the uh, for the idea. So that what I think that um, it actually be, didn't uh, come from you. <laughs> it would be I, maybe you don't remember our conversation last I week. I do, but, but was, this this was not from you. I swear the title the title is inspirational from you. Oh, okay. But I I was working on something similar, but you did it so much more so much better than I would have done. So I appreciate that. Appreciate all the effort that everyone is putting into these meetings this morning. Uh, back to you, Mr. General Evaluator. Thank you, Tom. I'd like to introduce our grammarian, Jill Roaring. Jill. Good morning, everyone. As you may have guessed, Steve and I were kind of tag teaming our roles here today. I was helping change, I was changing the colors on the computers he was timing. And he was helping me listen for grammar. Our use of exceptional grammar, poor or good, exceptional, was kind of miserly today. We were very bland in this regard. We had a tough time coming up with things to say here. I did write down a few comments. Thomas Heldwine, in his speech, he talked about being dry from too much drinking last night. Yeah. And the road to hell is paved with good intentions, both things that we know much about. Yeah. Eric talked, mentioned a mission to save lives. Larry Eggert corrected about being about Dave being a stalker. Jen used the terms cisgender and intersex and talked about self-defeating. Marty mentioned that Tom Heldwine spoke like a leprechaun. David mentioned how he was not interrogating, he was evaluating. And Mark, you talked about mastering the mute button. And that is all I and Steve could come up with today. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Jill. Our awe master, Samir, how did we do in terms of filler words? Today, everyone did pretty well. Dave, I noticed one, uh, Jim Walkerson had two ahs in his table topic speech. Kate had four filler ands. Marty had one filler and Thomas, I noticed one um, but otherwise it was a really excellent flowing speech. David Jones, one um, one uh. Eric, Eric Schneider, I, I didn't notice much except three unintentional pauses. Larry Eggert had two ums, three as. Jen had one ah, uh, two ums. And Tom Moran had three ums and one eh. But overall, people were fairly miserly with their filler words. So I think everyone did a great job today. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Samir. Our quiz master, Beth Banks. Qu uh, Beth. Thank you, General Evaluator. So were you paying attention today? Let us see. Who is funnier than Lucille Ball? No one. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> I, I agree. As, as per David Jackman. I don't agree. Wow. Okay. What was the 
All right, who's out there talking so much? Someone's got a TV on or something. Yes. What was the North Carolina plant that exploded? Master the mute button, folks. Master the mute button. My God. There we go. Dave was the offender. Dave. <laughs> Okay, say that again. What was the North Tonawanda plant that exploded? Jerez. Jerez. Very good. Where was the textile plant uh, mill that Kate mentioned? Lowell. Is this real? Yes, Lowell. 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 Not Lowell. Lowell. <laughs> Lowell. <laughs> Where did the leprechaun go before approaching the unicorn? To the witch. Sweden. Good, needed both answers, very good. Where does Eric donate platelets? Red Cross. Connect Life. Connect Life. Connect. Connect life. <clears throat> what advice did David give Eric to make his passing out more realistic? Fall down. Fall down, <laughs> Fall down. yeah, that's good. Very good, those are all the questions I have. Back to you. General Evaluator, thank you. All right, thank you, Beth. Last but not least, our Word Master, Sylvia. Well, I don't think I mentioned it. Sorry, Dave Lakata. You did use the word twice, Meister. Samir used it once. Thomas used it in his speech. He snuck it in there. I can't believe he did it. Good job. Uh, Dave Jones used it once, Larry Eckert used it twice, and Jeff Benny was no way a miser because when he, after he passed away, he had a rose delivered to his wife every day of her life, and I think she lived a lot longer than 20 years, so he paid for it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sylvia. And with that, I will cede control to our Toastmaster of the day so he can have the last word, David. Uh, the last word is because I love irony. And incredibly, we've done this comparison between Jamestown and Waukegan. But the irony is Jack Betty's next door neighbors were Lucy and Desi Arnaz. So I want to switch over to our president now and thank you everybody for filling their jobs and making my job easy. Eric Snyder, our president. Thank you very much, David. We would like to announce our winners today. All right, fellow Toastmasters, please help me in congratulating our best table topic speaker today. I know she left. But Tracy Farrell is our best table topic speaker today. Our best evaluator for today is David Jones. Congratulations to David. And our best speaker of today is yours truly. Are there, are there any final thoughts? Well, first, I want to say, hold on, Dave. I want to say good luck to Larry McKenzie and Den Zappa as they compete in the division contest this weekend. So we wish them the best of luck. And also, next week is our open house. Ryan Flory is our Toastmaster of the day. So with that, um, please confirm your roles for if you are assigned a role for next week. And spread the word of the open house by our guests to come and join us. All right, with that, I adjourn the meeting. It is 8.35. Have a good weekend, everybody. Post-Tosis is up next. Take care, everybody. Thank you.